When someone has a passion for what they do, it comes through in the product they provide their customers. Just ask La Rocca's Pizza's new owner, Jason Johnson, about their crust. They make it every day and let it rise for a minimum of 24 hours before they use it for their pizza. And his staff doesn't want to do anything they won't be the best at. And you can taste it in their pizza. La Rocca's Pizza, just a half block north of the I-470 in Gage Boulevard exit. Come taste the difference. It's the season for brand new mulch, and Brown's Tree Service has got your yard covered. Brown's Tree Service utilizes hardwood mulch that retains more moisture. Not only does mulch make your yard more appealing, it also reduces weeds, improves soil, and creates insulation for plants. Get the right mulch for your job at Brown's Tree Service. They shred it, haul it, and spread it in bulk. Or you can haul it yourself for the personal touch to your property. Call Brown's Tree Service at 785-379-9212 or visit online at brownstreeservicelc.com. It's time for Real Estate 101 with the Carrie Brown team from Preferred Advisors. Thank you for joining me. This is Carrie Brown, Associate Broker with EXP Realty and the Preferred Advisors team. And you're listening to Real Estate 101. I am back today with my guest co-host, Rick Glade. Rick is a multiple-time author, a serial entrepreneur. Um, you're, you're just in a lot of things, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um yeah, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur probably uh, at, at heart. You know, it's just something that's kind of in my blood. My uh, my dad was an entrepreneur, never really uh, had a W-2 job, worked uh, for a little bit at a young age, and then he kind of made it on his own and never really crushed it or knocked it out of the park, but he did provide and provided for us as a family as best he could at the time. And, and, uh, and yeah, so I think it's in the DNA, I guess. So you have a podcast. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so the podcast is called The Real Wealth Whisperer, and uh, so it's Whisperer, E-R-E-R, just like the horse, horse whisperer and those guys. Um, but yeah, something that, uh, that I, I did kind of to you know, pay it forward, I'm a big believer in, in, in kind of paying it forward. and um, I, I like mentoring people, especially if they have an appetite to be mentored. Um, I have a lot of people that engage with me, and they, they think they want to be mentored, um, the reality is they just wanted the paycheck. They didn't want to do the work. And <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and we all want that, right? I mean, we, it would be great if that was the reality, but, um, so what, what I discovered was, uh, it, it was, that was a, a modality for me to be able to, you know, just let people partake as, as they wish rather than, you know, kind of forcing it on somebody. So, um, and when does that air your podcast typically? Yeah, so the podcast, I, I used to do a weekly episode. I haven't done uh, episodes, and I've done a couple of radio interviews, and I did Business rock stars. And um, What I would do is on that particular podcast, I would have people submit questions. And so I would just answer the questions. So I would, uh, the format is basically, uh, I start out with my intro, I play the question that was asked, and then I go into a, uh, an answer that's basically a detailed answer for the question. So there's no interview process, kind of like what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. It's basically a question, and I and I go in and do the answer and then play it for them. So there's a bunch of questions and answers on it. In fact, that's what it's called. It's called Questions and Answers with the Real Wealth Whisper. And um, a lot of good stuff on there. I haven't done any episodes in a while um, just because it was a uh, time-consuming thing for me, and I've got some other stuff on my plate right now. And uh, But it's it's there, and, and I'll get back into it uh, sooner than later. It's really about life, love, and sustainable wealth. Sustainable wealth is something that I'm – really, really passionate about helping people create that in their lives. So what would be your, what would be your advice to creating sustainable wealth? Yeah, it's a great question. The, the reality is, is, uh, sustainable is a, a, a pretty powerful word, right? A lot of people, I mean, we've all heard of people that have made it and then they go broke and then they made it again and they go broke, right? I think sustainability is really looking at the end game and, you know, it's kind of cliche to, to hear that, right? People say, oh, the end game, the end game. But the reality is you really need to look at your end game. What are you trying to accomplish out of life? And what's the legacy going to be? So the sustainability is if the end game is going to be I want to be a millionaire or a multimillionaire or I want to own X number of properties or I want to donate this amount of money to charity or I want to cure this disease or whatever that is, you have to do sustainable actions to get there. Otherwise, um, it's all for nothing. And most people wake up every day to a rinse and repeat lifestyle, and that's sustainability by default, but it's not sustainability by intention. And so for me, the advice is figure out the end game. Where do you want to be, even if it's long-term and short-term? So 
you know, if you want to do a 20 year plan, a hundred year plan, you know, I tell people, I want my 200 year self to like my 100 year self. And people will chuckle at that. And the fact of the matter is I'm serious because even if I don't live to be 200 years or even if I don't live to be a hundred years, I want my legacy to live that long. Which makes perfect sense. I mean, you don't want to just fade away and, you know, everybody works for, for something, whether it be for your heirs or for yourself or a certain goal. Um, but, and I, and I see this really often for families that didn't do a lot of estate planning. And I grew up in a farming community, so, you know, the farms are always passed down from generation to generation. But not much else. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of planning otherwise. It was, you know, the kids are going to take over the farm. And then what if the kid didn't learn how to effectively manage the farm, you know? Right, exactly. Really understanding what is that goal. But I, I also see it a lot in real estate where nobody... The parents didn't educate them because nobody had educated them or given them any kind of direction. And now they're looking at long-term health care, and that gets eaten up quick. I mean, that, you know, they can sell your home, um, basically everything you've ever worked for just to take care of your medical needs. Um, Absolutely. And so without a plan, that's, that's what you're looking at. Yeah, one of the one of the uh, you may have heard this, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase it because I don't know exactly how it it, uh, it went. But somebody asked the Dalai Lama one time uh, what confused him the most, and his answer was man. And he said, "Man sacrifices his entire life to chase wealth, to sacrifice his health. In the end, only to sacrifice all the wealth to regain or rebuy the health." in the end, never really having lived. And if you think about that, it's pretty profound because that's what most people do. Most people that I uh, mentor and engage with and coach, by the time they get to me, they're so far behind the eight ball that it's, it's not impossible, but it's a real, real challenge to get back uh, on track. And it's like you said, it's because nobody, it's no fault of their own. But the only fault is the, the ignorance, if you will, and I don't mean that derogatory, I'm just saying that they didn't know what they didn't know, and so they were just doing life. And, you know, it's like you said, a generation passes down uh, some asset, a farm, uh, whatever that may be, a portfolio of whatever, it could be stocks, it could be some whatever wealth tool it may be, and if the next generation doesn't know what to do with it, or more so, even if they could sustain it and keep it, you know, if they just spend it all, and don't continue the investment. It'd be like just like having a million dollars in a savings account. You know, if you just keep taking out of the principal, you're going to eat it away someday. At some point, you're going to have zero. Right. So it's all about creating that plan. Um. So, say you're in your early twenties. You don't have a whole lot of debt. Um. Haven't purchased your first house yet. And and I'm going to give this example because it reminds me of my middle son. He is all about all the business books I have, uh, wealth building books, all that kind of stuff. I have to go find in his room because he's stolen them most of the time. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, which I'm totally fine with. Um, we trade out all the time. But for him, he's looking at, okay, I want to buy an investment and I want to rent half and I want to live in the other half um, and just start building wealth through real estate. If you were taking a 20-some-year-old kid, what would you say to him today? Yeah, it's interesting because I have those two children as well. And it's uh, currently, I have a 27 year old and I have a 21 year old. The uh, 27 year old has bought his first uh, investment property. Um, and we did it through a creative finance. And so what we did is we took a property over subject to, I actually had uh, somebody call me and say, Hey, look, there's this investor uh, that, uh, wants to sell this house. And so I thought of you. Um, and so I, I called and we, we had it, they were going through a divorce. The seller was going through a divorce. And, um, so the, the seller had a, a current mortgage on it. We took that mortgage subject to. So what that means is we took it subject to the existing underlying debt and we didn't have to qualify for it. When I say we, it was really key. I just kind of helped them structure the deal. Um, so, uh, in that instance, it was an investment property first. And I like the, the thought process of your, of your son, you know, think of the investment property first rather than your own principal residence, because the principal residence is going to become 
you know, it's an asset in a sense, but in reality, it's also a strong liability. Um, and when you buy the investment property, again, it may come with a liability, meaning the, the note and the mortgage, um, but it's, it's kind of pushed over to the asset side of the column, right? So if you're, you're looking at it financially, it's not something you can, in other words, you can take all of the rent that you can get from that and apply it to the, to the mortgage. Um, so, I, you know, again, I think that's the right process. Uh, my younger son right now, um, for him, we're working on some, some uh, entrepreneurship stuff. Uh, him and I are actually developing a website called Wealth Commitment. It's going to be a subscription membership type uh, website where uh, there'll be a free version for people, but then we'll have some other levels. Um, and that's something, again, Wealth Commitment being the name, uh, something that I'm very uh, passionate about having people commit to wealth. But you got to do the work, and that's um, where your son's starting, which is great. Um, so, but to, to protege and take you know somebody on that journey, it, I, you know, to be to be fair, I'd have to really know where his mindset is, um, what his skill set is, and and then give some advice, you know, really dedicated based on those things. Yeah, that's kind of hard to give a blanket statement for sure. Um, yeah. Okay, so you have talked about your coaching. Let's talk about that. So, who do you coach? How do they get involved with having you as a coach? Yeah, so the the, the, um, the best thing to do is if you go to realwealthwhisperer.com, dot com. Again, um, I start out with some some basic stuff there. There's there's um, what I call your wealth age and financial fitness test. And if you the, re, the reality is is uh, it, what that test does is about an eight minute video, and you go through a little exercise, and it kind of uh, explains to you what your net worth per hour is. But I like to really set expectations and benchmarks with people. I like to really discover where they are because, you know, it's hard to move the needle. Again, just, just like we were talking about a minute ago, it's hard to move the needle, uh, move the needle on, a, on a blanket statement or on a generalized uh, pro, you know, plan or process. I really dive deep with people, um, and I get specific. So I, I need to, again, know where your skill sets are. I need to know where you are today and then what we need to work on. And we kind of lay out this master plan. Um, for people to get involved with me, I typically do that one-on-one, um, and I'll usually do a couple of Zoom calls a month, and then they pay a fee for the for the monthly, um, basically, uh, coaching session. So you, you pay one monthly fee, and then we meet twice a year, I mean, I'm sorry, twice a month, and they kind of give you an exercise plan to, to go through each month. Um, so are you so taking clients... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love working with people because, I, like I said, I'm really passionate about it, and I like to see um, the evolution of, uh, of people. Because when they, you know, when you start breaking this stuff down for people, just like we talked about in the previous episode and some of the other episodes about uh, succession plans and you know how to get started and, and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's really it's really uh, rewarding for me to see people light up um, and and start to do stuff. Again, a, a lot of people. It's like anything. We all go to seminars. We all go to. You now, I believe firmly in always being a student, including myself. Um, I don't have all the answers, and you know, I don't know everything. But uh, so I attend a lot of seminars. I, I still have mentors. I still have uh, mastermind sessions. Um, and so, that all being said, uh, it's like any of us. Life gets in the way, right? Things happen. Uh, life happens, and we don't implement the process. It really takes accountability. And one of the things that I share with people. There's five things that create super achievers. The first one is clarity and focus. The second one is momentum. And the momentum comes from the clarity and focus. So if you have a, think of a chart, if you will, and if you have a linear chart and you just draw a horizontal line on it, that's going to be your directive or your objective or your focus. It's just going to be straight and direct. And what happens is our passion for that goes up and down. So if you drew a bunch of squiggly lines on top of the horizontal line, meaning over the top and over the bottom, that's how our passion is. Sometimes it's really high, sometimes it's really low. Sometimes it's really high, sometimes it's really low. It looks kind of like ACDC flow. And all of those two, uh, those two things match the end with our skill set. And the, the illustration might be hard to visualize, but when I illustrate it on paper, people really get it. So you have to have your passion at the top, your skill set as high as you can get it, and then that, that focus really linear. And that's how you transcend something. So whether it's sustainable success, whether it's your health, whether it's your uh, whatever, that's really, really how you get there. It creates the momentum. The third thing is the accountability, and that's where most people lack off, um, is that they're not accountable for themselves. 
So you have to put something in there to make you accountable, whether it's a penalty. You know, if we go down the road and the speed limit's 55 miles an hour and we're going 70, right, and we get a ticket, that's accountability, right? We knew what we should be doing, but we're doing something else, and somebody else held us accountable. So it's just that simple. It's just a basic illustration. And then the third thing, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth thing is reinforcement. And then the fifth thing is environment. So I tell people that think of it like an addict or religion, and I don't care what your belief is in religion, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to illustrate that addicts and religion both have reinforcement, and they both have environment. And so, you know, for the religion, they have Sunday school, they have, you know, the teachings in the Bible. For addicts, they have, you know, their 12-step programs, and they have, you know, accountability through whatever it is, sponsors and those types of things. And then they have environment where everybody can congregate with leadership. And if you remove people out of those environments, typically they go in the opposite direction. And so just to recap, it's clarity, momentum, accountability, reinforcement, and environment. And that's how you create a super shooter. You have to have those things in that order. Um, and the last two are ongoing. The first three are self-induced, and they have to be um, something that's, that's a practice. So ultimately, outlining a plan and then following the plan, staying motivated while you're working the plan, and then just keeping the path. Absolutely. I mean, I'm guilty of it. You're probably, you know, I'm sure you're, oh, well, you're, yeah. you're guilty, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like we all are, right? I mean, we went to the port of my heart saying, you know, you come out of there, you're just on fire, you're all charged up, you've got all these, you know, ideas, I'm going to go back and do this, you're looking at your notes, you're doing everything. And you get back and you land, and then all of a sudden it's like life happens. The kids, the husband, the, you know, the wife, whatever, the work, the job, the stress, the transactions. I mean, I could just go on and on and on and on, right? And then what happens, right? All of that momentum that we had right there just kind of stalls and starts to spiral. And then you got, you know, so it's really a challenge for all of us. Not, you know, not me, not you, but everybody. And so it's really, really just working through that stuff on a daily basis. And that's where mindset comes in. It really just takes a super dedicated, strong mindset, and most people give up. And like I said, the millennials, it's just so tough for them. and It's no fault of their own. They're so used to instant, instant gratification. Everything's on their phone. Everything is instantaneous, and they don't see that, so they give up. Yeah, I, but, you know, I think that that transcends all generations. I mean, looking back at generations like my parents, their parents were still trying to find their way. A lot of them didn't grow up with anybody giving giving them direction. So we all have an excuse in some way, form or fashion, um, for not doing what we should be doing. <laughs> so. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and you know, to your point, it's an excuse, right? That's exactly it. It's an excuse. And so when you can, you know, we can when you can find a way to overcome those excuses. When you can find a way, you know, and and here's how you find the way. You find the way is by looking at the end game and focusing on the purpose, focusing on the journey, right? Because otherwise the excuses will distract you and take you left and right. When you have the journey that is, like I said, if it's linear, there's no, there's no bifurcation from it. It's completely linear. It's like, here's the goal line. It's like, you know, it's like getting to home base, right? You hit the, you hit the bat, you swing, you take the swing of bat, a lot of times you're going to strike out. You take the swing of bat, you might get a home run. You take the swing of bat, you might get to second base. But it's a journey to get there, but you always know where the destination is. It's home base. It's not I'm going to run to first base, then I'm going to run to left field, then I'm going to run to right field, then I'm going to run back to second base. Right? It's really staying um, hyper-focused on that home plate and whatever that home plate is for you. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break for our word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Southwest Topeka has a good neighbor. State Farm agent Jim Garrison, now at 29th and Urish. If your current insurance situation has you going around in circles, get off the roundabout and stop in and meet Jim and his wonderfully efficient staff. Let Jim Garrison give you a quote and make the Garrison comparison. He's confident that with State Farm's competitive rates, the right coverage, and his unmatched service, you'll want to make him your new insurance agent. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there, and Jim Garrison is there for you. Northeast of the roundabout at 29th and Urish. 
When someone has a passion for what they do, it comes through in the product they provide their customers. Just ask LaRocco's Pizza's new owner, Jason Johnson, about their crust. They make it every day and let it rise for a minimum of 24 hours before they use it for their pizza. And his staff doesn't want to do anything they won't be the best at. And you can taste it in their pizza. LaRocco's Pizza, just a half block north of the I-470 and Gage Boulevard exit. Come taste the difference. At SportsMomsUnited.com, we celebrate every athlete and support every sports mom. SportsMomsUnited.com is on a mission to put logic back in youth sports. When you ask young athletes why they play sports, their number one answer is fun. For them, that means being on a team, making new friends, having a good time, all of which are awesome memories. We add to the memories by featuring an athlete of the day and sharing their story. Nominate an athlete today at www.SportsMomsUnited.com. Thanks for joining us again. This is Carrie Brown, Associate Broker with EXP Realty and the Preferred Advisors team. And you're listening to Real Estate 101. And I am back with my guest host for the month, Rick Glade. Um, Rick, we had mentioned being actually at an EXP conference in Puerto Vallarta. Let's talk about how did, why someone that actually didn't even need to be in a real estate brokerage at all decided to join EXP Realty. Ironically, I, I kind of accidentally... I call it a law of accident, right? So accidentally kind of fell into EXP. One of the top recruiters at EXP, him and I were actually at a multifamily, a multifamily conference. So multifamily is basically commercial real estate, like mainly apartment, bill, apartment buildings and that type of stuff. So we were at an investment conference on the East Coast, um, and he had introduced me to the model of EXP. And for the, those people that don't uh, know the model, Basically, it's a Netflix versus Blockbuster model. And the old model of real estate was that there was a corner store, if you will, or there was an office on every corner, or as many corners as they could possibly populate. Um, and we all know that Netflix is on demand online and you know very rapidly uh, scalable. And so EXP has that same exact model where they're on the Netflix side of that. They're online uh, brokerage uh, nationwide and now internationally in several other countries. And I just saw the scalability of that business model to be very impressive. And I thought, wow, if you could actually parlay that model into other businesses outside of real estate, uh, what, what a, a, you know, just what an explosive growth you could have. And so the entrepreneur in me is what attracted me to EXP, um, to your point of me not necessarily having to be there. By the way, let me, let me make a statement about that. When you don't have to do something, it's a great place to be to make a decision. See, most people have to do something out of necessity. And so when you have the ability to step back, analyze something, take a look at a deal, take a look at a business, take a look at an opportunity, and not have to do that, not have to say yes, it's a totally different perspective. It gives you a whole host of advantages over um, the opposite of that. Absolutely. Gives you a kind of clear insight and um, it's not muddy. It's just right. is what it is. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. you can make a ridiculous amount of money with EXP. Um, I mean, we're watching it all over the place and getting involved, not just watching. But um, it's just... It's unlike anything I've ever seen in the in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. You know, the, it really is, EXP is really the bottoms-up model of real estate. And all the former models of real estate, meaning where the brokerages controlled the leads, they controlled all the agents, they controlled the flow of the business, that was, you know, a top-down model. And that's the old way. That's the kind of the blockbuster way, if you will. And EXP has really exploded the agent-centric model and taken a bottoms-up approach, which means all the agents are really in control of the business, and they're in control of their own destiny, not only just through the income side, but through the business side. So you're in control of your leads. You're in control of your daily you know, input into the systems that they have. Um, you're in control of the training that you can partake of. This is ready, available, on-demand. And so again, the scalability of your of your own personal business. Forget EXP as a company, but you as an entrepreneur, the scalability and the way you can partake of the residual income component that they have, you can really, really explode not only your sales growth, but you can explode your residual income uh, through a passive measure on the on the backside of becoming a uh, agent attractor with the company. 
So our Puerto Vallarta trip was really more about how to, well, number one, how to to properly tell what EXP is about, but also how to invest the money that you're making. And to give you a quick story, um, I sat at dinner with um, Rob Flick, and Rob at one point had uh, had lost everything. He had been diagnosed with cancer, um, and this was years ago. Um, was a high rolling Cole Banker agent. Not that there's anything wrong with Cole Banker. Love Cole Banker, um, and um, he, he lost it all. And he said, "You know, I wasn't supposed to live, and lo and behold, I lived. But we didn't have anything left. We were living in my parents' basement, my, me, my wife, and my kids." And um, he said, so I had to start all over because guess what? I lived. And um, so he said that when Keller Williams came along, he jumped on board. He liked the fact that they would help agents if they got into trouble financially and built a massive um, downline through Keller Williams. Um, And then he was approached about EXP. And um, he said that he saw the growth, he saw the ability, he saw, he just, it all made perfect sense. And it was going towards a direction that he felt that the industry would go towards. So he left Keller Williams and came to EXP um, and then built this wealth that he never would have thought possible. So now all of a sudden he needs people to tell him where to put it. And so that just goes to show that EXP is building and the people involved are building such wealth that they're like, hey, somebody help me. I don't know where to stick this stuff anymore. <laughs> Not that I have that problem yet, but I want it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, and, and what's ironic is Rob and I, again, he's the one that I met in, in the Boston Conference, the multi-family conference. And so uh, we've known each other for a while. And uh, uh, to, to the point that you mentioned, it's exactly what I mentioned earlier uh, about people are behind the eight ball. So people obtain certain things or they get passed down uh, an amount of wealth and they don't even know what to do with it. See, that's the scary part. And so Rob's at a very scary crossroads right now because what happens is he's having to make decisions, having to make those decisions based on urgency rather than having the intentional and sustainable planning that we were talking about all along. So the key is you have to do these layups along the way just in case, just in case I win, just in case I hit the multi-million mark, just in case you know, whatever it may be for you, right? Um, but you have to do that intentionally. And so now there's all this bobbing and weaving going on, trying to figure it out. And the reality is you want to do that along the way. Can't, I can't stress that enough because you make the proper decisions that way. Absolutely. And for him, I mean, to go from one minute thinking, you know, there's a, there's a deadline, I'm going to die, to now all of a sudden they travel all the time. You know, he's, he's got the life that he always wanted and he dreamed of. But I have this money, and I have to figure out where to put it. So yeah, having friends you know like you is a good thing, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And one other thing I want to I want to stress um, right here that you, you just kind of touched on. You know, for me, I, once I kind of hit a certain benchmark, I kind of took a step back and I said, "Well, what's what, what's this really all about? What's this for? Why so many zeros? Why so much money? Why why X? Right?" And then I started to kind of focus on my own personal journey of health and, 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 and wellness. And not that I wasn't health, healthy or, or well, but I really started to focus on if you're going to have, even if you're not going to have, let me, let me rephrase that, you're not going to have, but if you're going to have you know, some type of wealth, I want, to, I want to be healthy enough to enjoy it. I want to, you know, so for me, I trademarked uh, two things. One is be wealthy, and wealthy is actually W H. Uh, I'm sorry, W apostrophe H E L E A L T H Y. So it's wealthy with a W H uh, with an apostrophe in the middle. And the reason I did that is because wealth and health go together. And most people don't realize that they focus on, like I said, the Dalai Lama, right? They focus on one or the other. And most of the time they're focusing on the chase of money and sacrificing all their health. So it's really, really important. And to, you know, to Rob's journey, he was crushing it. You know, commercial real estate agent living in an 8,500 square foot house, all the stuff, all the, all the bells and whistles that we all think are important. And really what we're doing is just trying to impress our friends that don't really have a dog in our race anyway. And then to have it all suddenly wiped out by one doctor's phone call. That's scary. And that can happen again to any one of us. We are already out of time again. And I'm really excited because our next segment, we're going to be talking about 
how to make sure that you're staying healthy while you're building wealth. So be sure and listen to that show. Thanks again, Rick, for joining me. And um, we will be back next Saturday. So be sure and listen to Real Estate 101. Thank you for listening to Real Estate 101 with the Carrie Brown team from Preferred Advisors. 